Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, we will start the second day of the APCD uh, Winter School. The first uh, speaker is the uh, lecturer is uh, uh, Dong An Yeom from Busan National University. Uh, he will today he will uh, teach the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Uh, please welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Um, uh, continuing uh, yesterday's uh, lecture, uh, I will um, discuss uh, uh, very fundamentals of uh, um, uh, information loss paradox of black holes. Uh, so as I mentioned yesterday, um, uh, what I will um, discuss is about um, very basics, I mean, the fundamentals to uh, prepare and understand the recent discussions about the information loss paradox. So interestingly, uh, it is scheduled that uh, tomorrow, from tomorrow morning, um, uh, the speaker will uh, will um, give a very recent discussion um, in string theories about the uh, phase curve and information loss paradox and so on. So um, um, I, this is not my talk, but I hope to um, uh, advertise um, for uh, any people who have interest. So um, yesterday I discussed about the Hawking radiation issue, and in the second lecture uh, I will talk about the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So uh, today I will uh, discuss about the following topics. Uh, first one is uh, the first and second rows of black uh, hole thermodynamics. Mm, of course, it's, mm, this is uh, the review of yesterday's uh, talk. Uh, and um, in order to explain the Bekenstein Hawking entropy uh, from not only from general relativity but also from um, quantum gravitational point of view, um, I will discuss about the Euclidean path integral approach uh, or so called the Hart Hawking uh, wave function. Of course, uh, this Euclidean path integral uh, is not, is a kind of quantum gravity, but it's not the um, perfect or um, complete version of the quantum gravity um, compared to, so to speak, uh, string theory, uh, because uh, this Euclidean path integral approach uh, cannot uh, explain uh, the, um, the graviton, I mean, uh, graviton uh, scattering uh, problem and renormalization issue. So uh, Euclidean path integral approach is not such a perfect theory, but uh, this can still provide a uh, non-perturbative uh, way to understand uh, the entire uh, wave function of the um, um, space-time and gravity and all matter fields. So in this sense, uh, uh, Euclidean path integral approach is um, very interesting and worthwhile. And indeed, this explains, this provides a very good uh, interpretations about the um, um, uh, Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Uh, mm, so, in in the Euclidean path integral approach point of view, um, the, the um, entropy comes from the Gibbons Hawking boundary term and Euclidean action integral. Euclidean action integral provides the uh, correct entropy formula. So, uh, in order to understand this, I must explain the Gibbons Hawking boundary term. And um, given Hawking boundary term and Euclidean uh, path integral, and I will uh, mention about the instantons, Euclidean instantons. So Euclidean instanton and so on, all, all the things um, uh, direct the physical meaning, I mean the intuitive meaning of entropy. What is the origin of entropy? And the answer of uh, Hawking is that uh, the entropy cost equals the topology cost this is the um, intuitive meaning of the non-trivial topology. Uh, no, 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 I mean non-trivial entropy. So I will explain the reason why the topology difference is related to the uh, entropy difference. Finally, um, so in, in this uh, topic, um, there are many topics that we can discuss, but um, as I prepare the lecture, I omit some topics and I include some topics. And maybe uh, one can shortly remark is the uh, third row of black hole thermodynamics. So third row means that uh, in the zero temperature limit, what is the entropy? And um, there is uh, some um, different stories between the Euclidean path integral approach and the string theory side. Um, and, and I will briefly um, mention about this interesting uh, story. Okay, so um, uh, let's 
uh, let's first uh, summarize uh, yesterday's discussion uh, and the first and second rows of uh, particle thermodynamics. So we have started from the Bardin Talking in 1973 paper. The stationary black holes are uh, parameterized by MQJ, mass M, charge Q, and angular momentum J. So I just repeat the yesterday's uh, slides. Uh, so for slow varying processes, the following rule is uh, satisfied. So as I mentioned, the important part is delta M equals the kappa of A pi delta M. This is the thermodynamic term. And kappa is surface gravity, A is the horizon area of the event horizon, and the other terms are just the working terms, comes from charge or angular momentum. So uh, this is very analogously uh, similar to the first row of uh, thermodynamics. T equals TDS, where E is the internal energy, and S is the entropy, T is the temperature. So it is very reasonable to guess that um, if M is the, uh, the, the internal energy, uh, then uh, kappa is proportional to the temperature, and A, A is proportional to the, the um, um, entropy. So uh, this was guessed by uh, Beckenstein in 1974. And also according to Hawking in 1971, um, a black hole area should uh, monotony increase, which is very similar to the second row of black hole thermodynamics. No, 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 second row of thermodynamics. This is very, not only restricted to the black holes, but also uh, this is very uh, general uh, nature of the uh, thermodynamic system. So this uh, delta A and uh, greater than zero uh, is very analogously the same as the uh, second row of thermodynamics. So uh, as I mentioned, um, initially Hawking disliked this idea, but uh, later he, what he proved is that a black hole emits uh, indeed thermal radiation. Um, uh, so, for a given omega energy, uh, the number density at future infinity uh, is uh, this kind of form where we know this form. This is a very familiar form, so-called the Planck distribution. So in the Planck distribution, this exponential factor is exponential uh, and, uh, omega over t. So omega over t term is nothing but 2 pi omega over kappa. Therefore, from this, uh, Hawking uh, could uh, read the temperature T equals kappa over 2 pi. And by comparing to the first row of black hole thermodynamics, uh, we could easily read that the uh, entropy equals A over 4. So we obtain the magic number 4, proportional constant, uh, 1 over 4 here. OK, so uh, this temperature is uh, called by the Hawking temperature. And uh, this entropy is called by the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So uh, Hawking temperature and Bekenstein Hawking entropy are already obtained in 1975. So, okay. Um, so uh, yesterday I discussed that uh, how can you obtain, how can you justify uh, the Hawking radiation? And there are several ways. So uh, first one is uh, the volume of transformation, the first introduced by Stephen Hawking himself. The second approach is the renormalized energy momentum tensor approach uh, that I will discuss tomorrow. And the third one is uh, the particle level tunneling um, approach. So first one is Hartle and Hawking developed, um, and uh, the, the other is um, equivalent one, uh, which is was developed, developed by Pari and Wilce. And um, um, up to one, two, three <laughs> ways, uh, first and second and third ways, it, it's uh, almost accepted by everyone. And the, I, I believe that there is a fourth way, the instant approach. But um, this is beyond the scope of uh, this lecture series, and please uh, later uh, read uh, my uh, paper. Anyway, so, uh, this was my um, uh, shameless uh, um, advertisement of my uh, previous works. Uh, anyway, uh, so up to 1975 and up to the Hawking's um, observation, uh, what have we obtained? This is the question. So uh, what uh, we obtained is, uh, uh, first, uh, we know what is this. We know uh, what is uh, energy. Of course, this is a classical quantity. And uh, what Hawking justified is that black hole emits the uh, radiation, and that has the temperature. So um, he obtained this uh, T. And then um, um, from this relation, uh, we define the entropy. 
something like this. So if you uh, read um, the thermodynamic books carefully, then in thermodynamic books, um, the entropy uh, is um, defined by this way. So uh, D bar Q is the uh, heat, this is the heat. And, and this is the temperature. So um, in thermodynamics, the entropy is uh, not the fundamental concept, rather uh, it is defined from the other uh, macroscopic um, variables. Uh, one is the heat and the other is temperature. And the ratio between heat and temperature provides the definition of the entropy. So in this sense, uh, what they obtained uh, as um, in 1975 uh, comes from um, two definitions. One is the black hole mass and the other is the Hawking temperature. So in this sense, um, uh, this entropy, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is the thermodynamic entropy. So uh, what is the, so it is a very um, basic question. What is the difference between the statistical mechanics and thermodynamics? So what is the difference? Of course, there is no, because they are very closely related and there is no um, sharp difference between thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. But uh, maybe uh, the, the, um, in my opinion, the difference um, is that in thermodynamics, um, we uh, describe the macroscopic variables. So macroscopic variable means uh, pressure, volume, energy, temperature and maybe heat and work and entropy and so on. And these are the macroscopic quantities that we can uh, measure um, in, in the macroscopic experiments. Uh, however, um, in the statistical mechanics, uh, we have a new ingredient that comes from the quantum mechanics and um, quantum mechanics provides the probability of uh, each uh, event. And uh, of course, we need to provide the approximation uh, such that uh, we consider the most probable um, configurations. However, the, the fundamental difference between thermodynamics and statistical mechanics is that um, either uh, whether uh, do we have uh, um, any uh, principles to provide the probability or not. So um, at this level, uh, if you define ds equals dm over t, then uh, there is no principle to provide the, the um, probability. So m is macroscopic quantity. t is also uh, somehow the macroscopic quantity that you can measure from the emitted particles. Therefore, in this sense, uh, ds um, de defined by dm over t is the thermodynamic entropy. And this is not the same as the um, statistical entropy or so-called the Boltzmann entropy. So, um, however, in our uh, generic sense of uh, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, thermodynamic entropy, for a given thermodynamic entropy, there must be a corresponding microscopic theory. Um, and in, in this microscopic point of view, now uh, entropy can be defined by the fundamental uh, principles from the quantum mechanics. So from this uh, fundamental principles, we can uh, define the number of states, number of accessible states. And from this number of accessible states, we can define the um, Boltzmann entropy. And uh, by providing some, some um, uh, constraints, we can define the canonical ensembles or uh, grand canonical ensembles, and we can uh, define the partition functions and so on. So uh, this is the point. So um, can we obtain uh, this entropy from quantum gravitational principles or not. Then uh, if, uh, uh, if uh, it follows our general feeling, then there must be some microscopic or somehow uh, more uh, quantum gravitational explanation for this summer, summer dynamic entropy. So um, in other words, uh, can we uh, obtain the Boltzmann entropy from quantum gravitational principles or not? So can you obtain any um, any, can you obtain any uh, entropy um, from the uh, quantum gravitational point of view? This is the question, very uh, important and fundamental questions. 
So I think uh, uh, the most successful um, uh, observation, su successful uh, proof um, about this relation comes from the string theory. Uh, so um, I will uh, later mention, uh, which uh, is um, from the famous paper, Strominger and Bapas, uh, paper in uh, maybe 1995. But um, uh, before we go to the string theory, uh, still um, uh, somehow a more um, classical approach uh, can also provide a very nice explanation um, about this. So, so when uh, you say thermodynamic entropy, uh, do you mean it's a, what, which ensemble do you, it, is it like a canonical or like a ah, Okay, yeah, 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 right, right. That's a, a very a nice, a very good question. So uh, uh, if we uh, follow the Euclidean path integral approach, then uh, we need to define the temperature first. So um, uh, what we will uh, do the canonical ensemble, then in the canonical ensemble, we can define the uh, partition function. And uh, from this partition function, we can um, uh, evaluate uh, the entropy. So uh, this can provide the principle to evaluate uh, the en entropy. How about, how about the micro canonical ensemble? Um, so uh, in Euclidean path integral approach, there is a way to define the entropy in micro canonical ensemble. For example, um, um, I I I, uh, <laughs> I vaguely remember, but uh, from the canonical ensemble, there is a way to transform some um, mathematical functions to the canonical no no I mean micro canonical ensemble. Uh, that is somehow indirect way, uh, or uh, maybe more uh, better um, fundamental exploration uh, comes from the uh, string theory. I think. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes. So. Um, so, um, uh, so the question is, can we explain the origin of the entropy from any uh, quantum gravitational principles? Then uh, perhaps the nice starting point is to find the partition function from the quantum gravitational principles. So uh, in this motivation, uh, first I need to first explain the Euclidean path integral approach first, and um, later I will uh, explain uh, how can we uh, provide the thermodynamic interpretation. Of course, uh, it's a little bit um, um, strange because um, the paper, what I first introduced is uh, 1983 paper. This appeared in 1983. And um, the second paper today I will introduce is the uh, Gibbons and Hawking's paper, which was published in uh, 1977. So historically, the order is a little bit uh, changed, but um, I hope you understand. So <laughs> this is a very important paper, uh, so-called the wave function of the universe. Um, the authors are Hutter and Hawking. So Hutter and Hawking wrote a very famous two papers, not only two, but uh, two papers are very famous. One was introduced yesterday, and today I introduced this, uh, a different paper. So especially this paper, paper is the more famous in terms of the quantum cosmology. So this this is so-called the uh, no boundary proposal or Hutterocking wave function and so on. But uh, um, uh, even though we don't go to the cosmological context, still uh, this paper is very important in terms of the uh, Euclidean path integral formalism. So what is the Euclidean path integral? Uh, before we say the path integral, I, I mean, uh, before we go to the Euclidean path integral, we must start from the path integral uh, itself first. So path integral is nothing but a propagator. So um, this is the propagator and this is the field theory. So uh, the path integral is sum over all uh, geometry string and all field values. So more formally speaking, we need to choose a certain uh, three hypersurface. So on the top of three hypersurface, we uh, add all the, uh, we sum over all geometries uh, that explains, oh, oh no, no, no. Mm. Uh, more formally speaking, we need to start from a certain initial three hypersurface and uh, there is a final three hypersurface. And, uh, we need to sum over all um, possible geometries that connect from initial to final hypersurface. Uh, this is this path integral implies this, and uh, path integral is about exponential i s as well as is the action. And um, uh, in uh, general, quantum gravitational background, uh, even though you fix the initial background, 
but final background may not be uh, unique. So in general, uh, this can be the superposition of uh, uh, various final um, classical boundaries. In terms of the classical boundaries, there there can be many different classical boundaries, and the the genuine final um, state must be the superposition of several uh, classical um, histories. So that's the reason why I denote here I two F J. Uh, so, uh, if you can evaluate this path integral, then you um, solve the. So, usually uh, we can uh, show that uh, this path integral satisfies the uh, Schrodinger equation or so called the uh, Hilbert de Witt equation. So, uh, and as long as you can uh, solve this path integral, uh, you know everything about the quantum gravity. So, um, then um, I lost my job because you solved every. Uh, problem of quantum gravity. So that's all. <laughs> However, <laughs> the problem is <laughs> there are lots of uh, problems to evaluate this um, uh, path integral. So uh, in order to evaluate this um, path integral at least um, um, approximately, um, the idea of hooking was to introduce the Euclidean analytic continuation. So uh, time is being rotated to the Euclidean, I mean, imaginary time. And then uh, this an um, is part is changed to minus se. So se is now so called the uh, Euclidean action. And we sum over all geometries, uh, but um, the, the, geometric, the signatures must be the, the Euclidean signatures. So um, then what is the benefit to change to the Euclidean signatures? And um, at least we know several examples. So if we don't include gravity, and then um, if you read uh, this paper, Arthur and Hawking's paper, then uh, they uh, discuss that. They discuss very kindly. So in, in, in many um, um, uh, quantum field uh, theoretical context, if you ring rotate to the Euclidean signatures, then uh, this provides the ground state wave function. So um, there may be some uh, physical reasons. So if you ring rotate the Euclidean time, then all the excited mode will uh, exponentially decays, and eventually uh, the ground state will survive. So um, intuitive, this is the intuitive reason, but um, based on this region, reason, uh, the uh, Euclidean path integral seems to explain the ground state. So I mean the lowest energy state in QFT. Then what about the quantum gravitational case? In the quantum gravitation case, uh, there is no well-defined notion of the entire energy because uh, the energy comes from the Hamiltonian, but Hamiltonian constraint is always uh, zero. It must be zero. So there is no, um, um, no good way to define the ground state. However, uh, if we analogously think about this, then probably you may guess that uh, Euclidean path integral can be the uh, ground state wave function of the entire universe. This is the conjecture of uh, Hartley and Hawking. So uh, the strong motivation uh, that Hartley and Hawking introduced this uh, Euclidean path integral is that this may be uh, the correct ground state wave function of the uh, entire uh, universe and entire quantum gravity. So probably this is a ground state wave function. And one more benefit of this Euclidean wing, uh, wing rotation is that now uh, it is more well approximated compared to the uh, to the Lorentzian uh, path integral. Uh, so, uh, so uh, usually it is very well known that um, this Euclidean uh, action, no, no, Euclidean path integral is well approximated by the on-shell histories. So, uh, in general, this action integral should include not only on-shells but also official uh, structures. And indeed, it is really complicated and almost impossible to do. Um, however, um, if this wave function is well approximated by the unshared histories, then um, I approximate uh, this path integral is the sum over all unshared uh, geometries that connects from initial state to final state. So uh, this can be approximated by sum over unshared histories. So, this approximation is very famous in terms of the, the, um, the uh, complex analysis, so-called uh, steepest descent approximation. So the intuitive meaning is something like this. So um, I took some photos from the Google <laughs> the website. So this is uh, 
uh, one uh, hand. This is the reality of the hand, but um, usually this is very complicated. So uh, in order to uh, intuitively um, understand the very essential nature of the, this shape, uh, we can use the X-ray. <laughs> then uh, in, in this X-ray photo, uh, uh, you can see that uh, you can see the uh, skeleton structures. Of course, uh, this X-ray figure uh, ignores all the other details. For example, um, there are many, um, I don't know the exact um, medical terminologies, but uh, there are uh, the other things. <laughs> but uh, this um, uh, X-ray approximates the shape of the hand, and this only shows the bone structures. However, uh, these bone structures um, approximately describe the, the approximate structures of the hand. Therefore, the steepest descent approximation is very uh, useful. So even though this Euclidean passive integral approach is not perfect quantum gravity, and uh, even though this uh, approach um, cannot explain every, the entire possible problems, but still it is very reasonable to guess that this Euclidean passive integral and the onshell, uh, interpret, uh, onshell analysis provides the uh, brief structure of the wave function of the universe. I think this is fairly uh, true. So uh, this fifth descent approximation uh, relies on the onshore histories. And now uh, one needs to sum over Euclidean onshore histories. So uh, by onshore, I mean that uh, the solution, I mean the metric and field uh, configuration should uh, satisfy the, the classical equation of motion in Euclidean signatures. So, um, the, the, is it equivalent to say that Euclidean onshore histories or so called the instant ones? So, I will, um, I will, um, I will use uh, these terms um, in many cases. So, uh, Euclidean onshore uh, solution is the same as the uh, instant ones or Euclidean instant ones. Uh, so, the uh, instant ones approximate the, the entire um, wave function of the, I mean, um, uh, this instantus approximates the Euclidean path integral. So this is the very important key point to understand the, the um, wave function of the universe. So um, uh, before I uh, discuss details, recently there was a, there was a, a debating between some communities, Hawking's family versus uh, some the other uh, people, in, including Neil Turo, and so on. So uh, uh, their uh, point uh, was whether uh, the steepest descent approximation uh, is well defined uh, or not in the Euclidean signal. So uh, uh, in order to check this, uh, we need to study the off-shell structures. And um, from this off-shell structures, um, is the um, this uh, instant on approximation um, good or bad? in terms of uh, at least uh, the quantum cosmology. So uh, I know that there uh, is a uh, debating, um, but uh, in my opinion, still, um, uh, it, uh, this is a, a very uh, good approximation. This provides a very good result. So, uh, so um, if I have um, another opportunity, then I hope to um, uh, discuss my opinions about this, but um, it's beyond the scope of uh, this uh, lecture. So uh, let me skip about this. Uh, so uh, formally speaking, the, this is the Euclidean path integral. So this is the past null infinity, and this is the initial um, uh, quantum state. And uh, what we need, need is uh, to um, um, explain from initial state to uh, final state. But um, in quantum gravity, there can be um, multiple final states, multiple final boundaries. So um, not only F1, but also there can be many um, Fi's, for example, um, let's say Fj. So uh, the genuine uh, quantum gravitational final state must be the superposition of uh, several um, classical boundaries. So sum over uh, Fj. So, uh, um, so frankly speaking, I draw this uh, figure by myself, but um, Several several days later, I noticed that in Hartley and Hawking's uh, paper in 2015, uh, he also drew the very similar figure. So start from the same initial boundary, but the final state, final boundary, 
must be in the superposition of several classical uh, universes. So um, this figure is very consistent to uh, this figure, I think. And then uh, this is the um, aim of the Euclidean test integral, but um, we need uh, the, the uh, CPS descent approximation, or uh, we will just consider some of the uh, instant ones. Then this means that um, um, from this initial state to the final state, uh, we need to provide the wing rotation at some point. And um, this means that uh, there must be a Euclidean geometry that connects the past boundary and future boundary. So um, conceptually, uh, the Euclidean and the signal terms becomes Lorentzian, Euclidean, Lorentzian. So um, the task is to figure out the on-shell geometry that connects from initial to final boundary. So uh, this part is a very important point. And this um, dominantly, this Euclidean geometry uh, contribute to the action and uh, it contribute to the probability of the process and of the wave function. So, um, the, uh, so this is a very conceptual picture and the aim of uh, the purpose of the Euclidean path integral is to uh, uh, do this, this kind of computations. So we need to find the instantons that connect boundaries at uh, infinity. Uh, okay, uh, and also um, this is one interesting comment. So uh, in uh, black hole physics or um, in many other generic contexts, this is a very generic figure. However, in terms of the cosmology, uh, it, it's a, a little bit uh, different. So it, uh, for example, uh, this is the uh, initial cosmological boundary and this is the final cosmological boundary. And then um, between this initial and final boundaries, so we will um, uh, consider all possible Euclidean geometries. But uh, if the space-time is compact and um, compact and regular, then uh, it is possible that the Euclidean geometries are disconnected, something like this. This is the Euclidean geometry for final boundary, and this is the Euclidean geometry for initial boundary. So the very famous idea of uh, Hartle and Hawking is that um, you know uh, the initial geometry and final geometry are uh, disconnected. So uh, what happens if we completely ignore the initial boundary? So you know all the quantum processes have uh, two boundaries, initial and final boundaries. Uh, one is defined as past infinity, and the other is defined as future infinity. But in the cosmological context, and if the entire space-time is um, somehow have the uh, closed topology, so if the manifold is compact somehow, then um, it is not impossible to ignore the initial boundary. So uh, then um, one may interpret that the universe is created from uh, nothing. So, so now, so you know, there is nothing initially. So. From nothing, the universe is created from quantum fluctuations. Uh, this is called by the no boundary proposal. Because there is no initial boundary. Uh, so um, this is very mm, interesting and mm, amazing, um, um, amazing proposal. I don't know. Um, so I wrote several papers about the no boundary proposal, but mm, I don't. Mm, I am suspicious whether we need to believe this proposal or not. But uh, even though um, still um, we, we are not sure, but uh, the, the idea itself is a very uh, wonderful, very nice idea. Um, so uh, in this no boundary proposal, there is no initial boundary. In this sense, it's a no boundary proposal. However, um, still there is a boundary because um, there is a future boundary. So um, uh, Don Peiji uh, mentioned that Indeed, this is not no boundary proposal, but one boundary proposal because there is a, uh, one boundary at future. <laughs> so, <laughs> so usually in quantum mechanical process, there are two boundaries, initial and final boundaries. So there is no initial boundary, then there is a one future boundary. Therefore, uh, this is this must be the one boundary proposal. Mm. But um, this is a joking, and <laughs> the no boundary means that there is no initial boundary. So in this sense, this is no boundary for that. So um, uh, of course, this is beyond the uh, scope of this lecture. This is about the quantum cosmology. But um, as a common sense of um, Euclidean-based integral approach, I wanted to mention about this. 
Okay, so uh, this is the uh, basic uh, intuitive picture. So uh, what is going on um, in the field of uh, Euclidean path integral approach? Then uh, now we come back to the black hole background and um, we discuss how uh, can the entropy can be explained by this Euclidean path integral approach. Uh, this is um, based on the very famous paper by Kim Hawking in 1977. So um, I um, captured this um, paper. The title was uh, Action Integrals and Partition Functions in Quantum Gravity. So um, partition function means that uh, this is something about um, um, statistical mechanics in uh, quantum gravity. And the action integral is a little bit um, uh, different. I mean, <laughs> the, the action integral and partition functions are uh, very different two notions, but in this paper, two, two notions are integrated uh, by a very uh, important, interesting way. So let's start from the black hole background, and this is the causal structure of the Schwarzschild uh, black holes, and this is the uh, Schwarzschild black hole geometry. So everybody uh, uh, knows about this. Mm. Okay, and uh, then. Uh, in order to uh, study the nature of uh, uh, Euclidean geometry better, uh, it is very convenient to um, change the variables. Uh, for example, uh, I uh, redefine um, the parameter x uh, by this way. I define a new parameter. Then um, when uh, r is infinity, uh, r goes to infinity, then, um, then uh, it goes to zero, x goes to 4m. And x goes to 2, uh, no, no, r goes to 2m, then x goes to uh, 0. OK, OK. OK, so this is the parameter change. OK, then um, uh, as a simple uh, exercise, so the horizon is located and at x equals zero. Uh, that is the important point. And, and then um, in, by introducing the parameter change, uh, you can um, write down the metric uh, as follows. So this is uh, just a simple computation and, and I will let uh, reproduce here. Okay, so uh, now, uh, of course, um, um, R is now function of x. So I omit it here. So R is function of x. This R is also a function of x. So um, you can always uh, choose a different metric variables. So um, now um, this is the same metric, but presented by the coordinate t and x rather than t and r. So, and I believe um, there's no uh, problem to do in this way. And then um, our interest is to win rotate the time uh, to the Euclidean time. Then what happens? So um, Euclidean analysis continuation means that t is being rotated to, to, to minus i tau. And then um, the, this Lorentzian metric is transformed to this way. So the uh, signature becomes plus, plus, plus. And uh, you know, this is the, um, uh, the, the uh, d theta square plus sine square theta and d phi square. So again, the signature is plus, 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 plus. Um, so this is the Euclidean, Euclidianized uh, Schwarzschild black holes. Now, um, of course, uh, the, the manifold might be well defined, but um, we may uh, ask the question: What uh, happens at the horizon? Because uh, you know this um, coordinate change only covers the outside of the horizon. You no, know, if R is um, less than two m. Then, if R is less than 2m, then this um, metric is not very defined. So, uh, this means that um, this metric presentation only covers the uh, outside the um, um, event horizon. Then, uh, what happens uh, near the event horizon? This is the question. So, um, as R goes to 2m, the x variable goes to 0, and then uh, we can. Um, present uh, the metric approximately near the horizon, and then the geometry um, looks like this. 
So um, as r goes to 2m, uh, this part is approximately one. So um, the first term is nothing but this one. So let me draw this way. So this term goes to here. And uh, the second term goes to here. I just um, extended the order. And then, um, what does it look like? So, um, of course, uh, this is nothing but uh, the S2. But uh, the question is, what does it look like? So, um, uh, the very uh, simple explanation of the uh, polar coordinate of the space time is nothing but dr square plus r square d phi square. Uh, this is the um, you know, polar coordinate r. Here is the center, and this is the angular direction. So by comparing this and um, this, it's very, um, uh, very similar. Indeed, it's very similar. And um, uh, if you choose uh, the, the, the uh, if you choose the, the angular variable, so, so this means that um, now tau is somehow the angular variable. And uh, x is the radial variable. And um, if you choose the tau um, um, nicely, then the period of tau um, tau direction can be uh, equal to two pi. So if you define theta uh, by tau over four pi, then uh, tau square is sixteen m square. So um, if you define uh, theta equals tau over four uh, no no four m, then um, now uh, this um, geometry near the horizon is exactly the same as the x square plus x square d theta square. So exactly this part is the same as uh, d2, two-dimensional disk geometry. So this, the omega square part is uh, S2 geometry. And I mean S2 topology, and uh, uh, this indicates the d2 topology. But the necessary condition is that theta must be defined by tau over 4m. So if you don't uh, define the period by this way, uh, so, so, so in this way, uh, the, the entire period of angle must be two pi, and then um, two pi means delta tau over four n. So the period of time is eight pi n, which is interestingly the same as one over t inverse of the Euclidean, no, no, inverse of the uh, Hawking temperature. So uh, this correspond, uh, this correspondence, the periodicity of the Euclidean time and the inverse temperature. Uh, such a relation is um, uh, obtained from um, the geometrical analysis. And this is very typical um, correspondence uh, in um, statistical uh, mechanics. However, what happens if uh, the periodically identified angle is um, uh, smaller or less than this two pi. Then what happens? Then, uh, then um, you know, near uh, near the center, near the near x equal zero point, uh, this point uh, cannot be smooth because uh, you identified um, um, more than or less than the two pi. So for example, for example if uh, you identify um, you identify uh, this tau um, or theta shorter than two pi, then the geometry should look like something like this. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Geometry should do some, something like this. So this point is not regular. So we say that there is a cusp, cusp singularity appears. So in order to avoid the, the existence of the cost in the Euclidean manifold, uh, the only uh, canonical um, Euclidean time period uh, is this one. This is the only condition for the um, uh, cost-free condition. Then in, in this cost-free cost condition, um, uh, uh, delta tau equals um, a pi m, which is the inverse of the working temperature. So the canonical Euclidean time period becomes delta tau equals eight pi m, uh, which is the same as beta, 
uh, or you know, in statistical mechanics, beta is uh, one of them. And at the same time, if it is the case, then uh, this um, pink colored part is um, regular two dimensional disk. So the topology is D2. And the other white colored region is uh, nothing but the sphere, so S2. So this uh, geometry on the same as this one, because uh, there's no topological difference between this and this. So this Euclidean traversal geometry has the D2 cross S2 topology. This is the, the important point. And um, if uh, I ignore this S2 part, then the geometry becomes uh, this way. So the center is X equal zero and infinity, so X equal infinity or uh, maybe I'm wrong. So maybe this is not X equal infinity, but it's better to say here is R equals infinity. So here is the boundary R equals infinity and here is the X equal zero. And then um, um, this is nothing but the D2 uh, topology. So the geometry is very simple and this is the Euclidean time. So Euclidean time is period. Uh, uh, this Euclidean time is a, a definite period, which is uh, A pi M. Okay, so um, now uh, let us consider the matching between two geometries. So. Uh, the Euclidean analytic continuation means that in the Lorentzian geometry, we choose a certain uh, hypersurface and uh, so T equals constant hypersurface. And at this T equals constant hypersurface, we uh, analytically continue to the Euclidean time. And in the Euclidean side, again, this yellow colored curve corresponds to a certain um, hypersurface here. So um, we cut the space time along this. Um, Mm, constant time hypersurface and match it together this way. Then this is the uh, analytic continuation of the Schwarzschild black hole from the Euclidean geometry. So here's the Euclidean part and this is the Lorentzian part. So now if we uh, revive yesterday's discussion once again, then uh, coordinate time, so let's, um, without loss of generality, we can choose this as t equals zero hypersurface and mm, time goes to infinity. And uh, here is again t equals zero. And this point is t equals minus infinity. And co coordinate time uh, evolves into this direction. And uh, this time uh, can be identified to Euclidean time zero. And um, the uh, correspond uh, tau increases to this direction and this part corresponds um, tau equals four pi m. Because uh, the, 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 the entire uh, Euclidean time period is a pi m. So if you cut the half part, part then of course the, the Euclidean time at this point must be four pi m. Or um, without, again, without loss of generality, you can just define uh, this is zero and this is minus four pi m. This is also possible, I think. So this is the consequence of the analytic continuation and the matching time parameters, um, both of Euclidean and Lorentzian geometries. So now uh, in this background, um, let's ask a question. Uh, what is the entropy cost of a black hole? Mm. So um, as an analogous, um, as an analogy, uh, I use the terminology cost. So cost is nothing but the money that you um, buy something. <laughs> So uh, if uh, you um, buy the first the black hole, then um, uh, how much do you need? This is the question. Um, the cost, so in, in uh, quantum mechanics, the cost is related to the, 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 the probability. So uh, if it is in principle possible, then uh, quantum mechanics allows everything. But um, everything are not equivalent because uh, the probabilities are different. So, uh, so if the probability is very low, then this means that cost is very high <laughs> intuitively. And <laughs> if the probability is very high, then you may say that cost is very low. You can easily see this. Uh, so something like this. So if the probability is very low, then entropy must be very big. So in this sense, um, the entropy cost is very big and probability is very low. 
Uh, on the other hand, um, if the pro probability is very low, then entropy is very small, and then you can easily obtain, you can easily find um, from quantum fluctuations. So in this sense, um, I think the anal analogy with the cost is not uh, that strange. Mm. So then, what is the entropy cost of the the Schwarzschild black hole? And um, the naive answer is that the entropy cost is um, infinite, infinity. <laughs> Usually, it's infinite. Uh, however, um, the infinity comes from the fact that um, um, if you only see a certain solution, um, the cost is in general infinite. However, um, always we can believe that there is a background. There is some. There is a let's say there is a Minkowski background, and in this Minkowski background we consider the nucleation of the black hole geometry, for example. So in this sense, um, so of course and the, the entropy cost of black hole itself is infinity, but um, from the beginning uh, the, the the background the Minkowski background has also the infinite um, entropy cost. Uh, so if you subtract the infinity minus infinity. Then uh, uh, you may then the uh, finite the entropy cost. That this is the, the idea of uh, how to estimate the entropy cost from the Euclidean path integral approach. So let me say more details. So first, of all, how can you obtain the thermodynamic thermodynamic interpretation? The Euclidean signatures allow the thermodynamic interpretation by this way. So in this is the Euclidean path integral, but um, if you are doing the um, uh, if you are doing the statistical system, so uh, if you don't regard the Euclidean time as the um, time parameter, but if you interpret this as the temperature, then it's very well known that this Euclidean path integral corresponds to the um, um, the partition function where the partition function is traced out over all over the com configurations where it is the expansion minus beta h and h is the Hamiltonian and beta is one over t. So the correspondence, uh, the, the equivalence between past integral and partition function is very well known. And, and in terms of this um, uh, uh, partition function, in terms of this partition function, uh, again, there is a very well known correspondence between a partition function and a macroscopic variable. Uh, Helmholtz free energy. So um, in canonical ensembles, uh, G is always the same as the exponential minus beta F, where uh, F is so-called the Helmholtz free energy, and F is um, related to the macroscopic observables, E minus ST. ST. E is the internal energy, S is entropy, and T is the temperature. So E minus ST is the Helmholtz free energy. So uh, indeed, this is the bridge between um, microscopic statistical mechanics and macroscopic thermodynamics. You know, E, S, T, all of them are macroscopic quantities. And this path integral or partition function comes from the uh, microscopic principles. So uh, this is the bridge between microscopic to the macroscopic um, um, relations. So um, this is macroscopic quantities. The, and uh, one additional ingredient, ingredient is that um, based on the uh, space to descent approximation, the space integral is well approximated by the uh, instantons. So this is, this is the exponential minus uh, S um, on And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, you can notice that there is an approximation. Uh, but um, approximate, you can say that approximately, uh, this exponential minus S, S E corresponds to exponential minus beta. This is a very important correspondence. So uh, therefore, the Euclidean action Xe over an instanton is interpreted as beta. This is the um, principle to uh, provide the thermodynamic interpretations for uh, all um, instantons. Uh, so uh, the action integral is related to quantum gravity, so it's uh, more closely related to the uh, microscopic interpretations, and this microscopic computation is related to the microscopic observables in this way. So then, um, in order to evaluate entropy, as so, of course we know energy and we know temperature. So in order to compute this entropy, 
you need what you need to compute is the Euclidean action. So let's uh, uh, discuss the how to um, evaluate the action. However, um, as I mentioned, the Euclidean action is in general infinite. <laughs> so um, I'm saying um, not always, but um, um, exceptional case is the distal space. In the distal space, um, it's it's fine, right? But um, in pure Minkowski case and ADS case, it's simply infinite. <laughs> so in order to say the meaningful um, entropy cost, uh, we need to find a way to make it um, finite, or we need to find a way to regularize such an infinite action. So uh, this is the procedure. First, let's uh, prepare the Euclidean asymptotic Minkowski. This is very important. We first prepare the Euclidean asymptotic Minkowski background. This is the default geometry. And uh, of course, um, in this uh, Minkowski geometry, there is no manifest periodicity. So, uh, you know, at the center, uh, it, it is R equals zero. So, um, R equals zero, and you can provide any um, periods. So, we, we say that, um, so you can identify with any period um, without the problem of the cusp. So uh, this geometry is called by the periodically identified Minkowski geometry. The same thing happens for a uh, distal space or anti-distal space. So um, it's, if it is pure this or pure A this, then near um, near R equals zero, you can identify with any time. So um, then the Euclidean geometry is periodically identified distal or anti-distal. So you can always define this. So this is the periodically identified Minkowski. And then um, cut on arbitrarily large radius. I hope, I believe that <laughs> this figure is very uh, intuitive. So you cut the space time um, by a scissor. <laughs> and, and, and then, then uh, what I want to do is to insert uh, black hole geometry to this uh, center. The third stage is that um, here is the uh, uh, Schwarz uh, Euclidean uh, geometry. And again, here I cut the same radius according to this decided uh, circle and, um, and move this disk and insert to the asymptotic Minkowski background. This is the task what we should do. So insert the Euclidean Schwarzschild geometry like this. I hope <laughs> I hope that this is very intuitive and maybe not um, uh, difficult to understand. Uh, of course, uh, technically, uh, so if you cut the space time, um, maybe there's no problem. So it's nothing but uh, there is a um, um, there is a boundary in the manifold. So there can be a boundary in the Euclidean manifold that in itself is no problem. But if you uh, match two geometries, uh, so one is uh, black hole geometry and the other is pure Minkowski, and if you um, paste them, then um, of course we need uh, some junction condition. It is not, there is a non-trivial junction condition here. So, um, what is the junction condition? Um, this is nothing but the, uh, at this junction, the Einstein equation must be satisfied. So the metering must be continuous. This is the first Israel assumption condition. And the second uh, condition is that uh, the first derivation, or uh, no, no. So um, the metering must be continuous. And um, uh, before, no, 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 I mean, Inside and outside the junction surface, uh, there must be a suitable um, matter that um, explains. This is something like the delta function, like the meta shell. Uh, that is necessary to explain the differential equations of the metric. Uh, that is the Einstein equation. So uh, there are two um, junction conditions. One is the continuity of the metric, and the second one is um, uh, um, the, the continuity of the curvatures 
inside and outside the curvature. If uh, curvatures are not continuous, then we need to uh, introduce a kind of a meta chain like this. So in the spherical symmetric case, uh, this, is, this part and this part both are the extrinsic curvatures. Extrinsic curvatures. And uh, of course, uh, they uh, are not uh, the same uh, if we just cut and paste the two geometries. Uh, however, uh, if we have uh, some meta, meta shell, then uh, this can explain the sigma is the tension. So this can explain uh, the, the Einstein equation. So um, if you cut and paste black hole and Minkowski geometry, then you need to introduce some meta shell. Um, then um, it's a little bit um, unnatural, but um, if you locate this shell uh, to be arbitrarily infinity, then uh, the tension of the shell will go to zero. Uh, this means that um, you don't need uh, the shell if uh, you paste uh, at the infinity. But if you paste in a finite radius, then of course you need this um, physical object uh, with a non vanishing tension. And after simple computations, the extrinsic curvature um, becomes as it follows. So um, k plus minus is presented by this way. So again, uh, this uh, extrinsic curvature uh, formula, and you, you can easily find the uh, um, textbooks and reference books. So I just uh, denote, um, I mean, I just um, um, write down um, by this uh, form. And then uh, in first step, uh, move the shell to be infinity. Then, um, of course, as I mentioned, the tension uh, will go to zero. Therefore, um, you don't need the physical tension, but still uh, you uh, need to satisfy the continuity in um, metric continuity condition. And also you have to um, think about the um, extrinsic curvatures. So now uh, using this procedure, we compute the, the entropy cost of the Euclidean uh, black hole geometry. Uh, but uh, the physical meaning is that um, I'm not saying the entropy of the black hole itself. I am not saying the entropy itself, but uh, what I'm saying is the entropy cost to insert a Euclidean black hole into Euclidean Minkowski. So then we need to subtract the action between the Euclidean Minkowski and Euclidean black holes. That is the very important point of the Gibbon so King's paper. So this is the Euclidean action uh, in general. And um, of course, you can easily notice that this is the Einstein action. And um, this is maybe an unfamiliar action. And you know, uh, this um, Einstein action Mm, uh, is integration over the all the space and time. But, uh, you know, this is only um, defined at the uh, three hypersurface because um, this is the bulk uh, Euclidean action and this is the boundary action. Um, you know, um, the boundary term does not um, affect any equation of motion in the bulk side. So uh, if you are uh, doing the, just the, if you solve the, a bulk equation of motion um, um, in astrophysical purposes or, and so on, then uh, you don't have to worry about this boundary term. However, <coughs> uh, even before uh, the Gibbons Hawking's paper, indeed the boundary term uh, was somehow necessary because uh, in order to uh, derive the equation of motion, at some point you need to introduce the integration by part. And uh, integration by part creates the boundary terms, but the boundary terms seem to diverse, but um, in this action, um, there's nothing um, um, that cancels such a boundary terms. However, if you introduce this kind of term, um, then um, uh, such a, when you derive the equation of motion, um, um, the boundary term from this bulk term and this um, secondary boundary term will be canceled exactly. So, uh, it is um, even uh, in Lorentzian space time, uh, the introduction of this boundary term was very um, mathematically useful. Um, but 
but um, in the Lorenz and space time, it is mathematically useful, but uh, physically not necessary. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, um, fair to say. Uh, however, in the Euclidean second terms, uh, the second term is very important. The second term is known by the gibbon soaking boundary term. So it is very important. Uh, and this is very important because, um, you know, <laughs> Uh, this term, the first term, Perk term, vanishes for Minkowski or Schwarz space time. At once you ignore this, then um, now <laughs> uh, this boundary term becomes very important. In this case, they extend the curvature. So um, let's plug this uh, Euclidean geometry to evaluate this extended curvatures. Then they are, they are basic um, building blocks. Uh, this uh, three, for this three hypersurface, uh, this is the metric variables for a three hypersurface. For a constant x, no, no, constant r hypersurface, then only um, three variables, tau, theta, phi. Oh, no, no, no. So we have to worry about the sine uh, theta. So um, uh, I will, later I will update. Uh, um, Ah, no, 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 uh, this is right, no problem. <laughs> this is right, and the sine theta is inside this square root part. Okay, so square root 18 includes this sine uh, term, and uh, this k comes from uh, the previous slide formula. So uh, if you plug uh, all three terms into this uh, action, and if you integrate this, then um, the computation is very simple. So you will obtain this kind of uh, result. And one, one point is that the, the, uh, you need to integrate over the time, but uh, Euclidean time is compact. So you obtain um, a pi m uh, for the Euclidean time integration. However, um, uh, this is self diverges. Therefore, we need to um, compare to the Minkowski case. In the Minkowski background, again, we have the same uh, form of the um, uh, we have the same form of the uh, Kimonsukin boundary term, but the metric is different. So the extrinsic cover cell term is a little bit different. And then um, uh, you need to integrate over the Euclidean time. Uh, but um, as I mentioned um, in the Minkowski case, you can identify with it any times. Then um, how to choose such a time coordinate? This is the question. So. Um, I just said, you know, the um, Euclidean time period of the Minkowski by delta tau plus. However, um, the metric must be continuous for the inside and for the outside. And for the inside, uh, this tau minus square plus um, um, for a constant x surface, we don't uh, constant R surface, we don't have to worry about this. And uh, this is minus N. And outside is F plus, D tau plus, S K D omega square. So they are automatically continuous. And the remaining part is this. But if outside the geometry is Minkowski, then um, this is nothing but D tau uh, plus square. Therefore, um, if you identify outside the geometry, delta tau, then you have to satisfy uh, some condition, something like this. And you know, uh, delta tau minus is, F minus, delta minus is uh, uh, a pi n. So uh, what you need is, is uh, this kind of uh, condition for the uh, uh, Euclidean time period of the Minkowski. So this uh, condition uh, comes from the um, continuity condition at infinity. So, so you will obtain this kind of condition. And then um, you obtained uh, the, the Euclidean action contribution from the Minkowski background. So uh, then uh, the final task is the subtraction between uh, the black holes and the Minkowski background. This is the entropy, I mean, Euclidean action cost to insert the, um, um, the black hole geometry inside the Minkowski background. And then, um, 
I just copy and paste the previous results. And then um, um, near, so f is one minus two m over i. And f prime is this. And square root of f is more complicated, but um, as you locate the boundary to infinity, then approximately it becomes one minus m over i. So if you plug in all three terms, then um, it's a very simple. You, you can do it by yourself. And the final result equals uh, 4 pi m squared. So um, it is surprising. So 4 pi m squared is just something. Maybe if you, your memory is very nice, <laughs> then you think that uh, 4 pi m squared is very related to the entropy. It's very close to the entropy. But um, I warn that uh, you must be very careful. Um, this is not entropy. But as I mentioned, uh, 4 pi m square is the free energy of a temperature. Um, so um, m minus st divided by t. So m over t minus s. So this 4 pi m square is not entropy itself, but m over t minus s. And you know, uh, m, uh, m is m and t is a pi m. Therefore, um, you can check that s is um, minus 4 pi m square plus m over t. And m over t is 8 pi m square. And therefore, s is 4 pi m square, which is a over 4. So uh, by this way, uh, you, uh, so the important thing is formally, you need one step more. So uh, the action difference is not the same as the uh, entropy, but um, eventually you could obtain the, the Bekenstein hooking entropy from the Euclidean action integration. So this is the quantum gravitational derivation of the Bekenstein hooking entropy following the Euclidean path integral approach. So um, we could obtain a um, four formula. So as I mentioned, the action difference is not exactly the same as the entropy, even though this four pi m square is the same as this four pi m square. This is just a, um, um, how to say, it is just an accidental correspondence. One interesting uh, example is the twister space case. The twister space case, uh, Euclidean action itself is uh, finite because um, the Euclidean volume is uh, finite. Mm. And uh, this is uh, the same as m over t minus s. But uh, in the twister case, there is no ADM mass for the pure twister space. So if m goes to zero, then s e equals minus s. And s is the entropy, this s is entropy, s e is the Euclidean action. So uh, the entropy must be positive. Of course, in some textbooks, there are some cases for the negative entropy, but, but in general, <laughs> in general physical cases, entropy, mm, no, no, no. Entropy, right, 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 right. So, yeah, sometimes um, somebody says some negative entropy, something, but, but it's a, um, a different story. And <laughs> uh, in most physical situations, entropy must be positive. And then this means that the Euclidean action must be negative definite. It must be negative definite. And uh, indeed, this is the case. And in this the space case, uh, if you compute the Euclidean action, then it is a negative definite. Therefore, um, 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 the entropy of the distal space is um, positive definite. Therefore, the probability is in exponential enhanced because, um, you know, uh, wave function is exponential approximately as e, but uh, as I mentioned, s is a negative definite. So it becomes uh, some positive number. So the probability is exponentially enhanced uh, for the distal space case. So if some probability is exponentially enhanced, then you may feel it's very uncomfortable. But um, in, in real cosmological applications, um, in general, there is no problem because um, we don't, in many uh, realistic situations, we don't uh, compute, uh, we don't uh, compute this way. Uh, the, the most important thing is the um, decay rate, which is the, the action difference. And usually the, this, this the action itself is um, negative definite, but action difference um, must be positive definite. 
So, mm, in uh, general, uh, even in the discussion. Uh, yes, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, well, can you comment uh, on uh, the validity of this quantum gravity computation uh, in terms of G Newton uh, somehow? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. The validity of uh, this uh, the quantum gravity computation uh, in terms of G Newton. Uh, uh, in terms of G. Yeah, what kind of approximation? Uh, we ah, okay, 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 okay. Uh, 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 I, I'm uh, I'm not sure in terms of um, G, but in terms of H bar, probably um, this this uh, steepest descent approximation is only good um, for for the case H bar is very small. Uh, this means that it cannot include um, um, high, higher order loop contributions. So this is very uh, uh, close to the classical um, geometries. So I, I don't know whether my answer is um, the same as your uh, question. Uh, probably, I, I mean, the Newton constant should be extremely small. Uh, that's right, that's right, that's right. I, I guess. That's right, that's right. So it did, uh, that is already assumed, right? Uh, okay, okay. Mm. Right, right, right. Yeah, okay. So uh, what I said is uh, um, the, the uh, action difference in practical situations are always uh, positive definite. So uh, even though the distraction itself is exponentially uh, enhanced, maybe in itself it's not a problem. However, um, this may, um, mean that um, uh, the, the entropy of the Minkowski itself is um, infinite. Then maybe uh, we need uh, the regularization technique and, um, and there are some subtle topics. Um, in any case, uh, for the black hole case, um, as, as you see, uh, if, you say, if you subtract the uh, black hole uh, Hoking boundary term to the Minkowski, then you will obtain the finite and consistent uh, result. Uh, so now you... the, the, the entropy of the shitter, is it the uh, black hole in the digital space or the digital space itself? Uh, what I said is just the um, digital space itself, pure digital space. So what does it mean of the entropy? Ah, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, in uh, this double, this double, no, 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 no. This pure this double case, there is a cosmological horizon. So, okay. um, the, the, the entropy should be A over 4, where A is the uh, horizon area of the cosmological, uh, I mean, cosmological horizon area. And then, if you are asking about the, the meaning of uh, entropy, then uh, it is very subtle, but it is, uh, in, in, my, in my understanding, this is uh, related to the uh, summer fluctuation of uh, some of the um, uh, of the meta field, for example. So um, the, 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 this is the probability to be excited um, to have such a cosmological constant or a vacuum energy. Okay. Okay. So 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 <laughs> yeah. You know, so this is somehow out of uh, the, this topic, but okay. uh, the, yeah, the. the uh, uh, meaning is that um, so uh, the, the, the pure digital um, entropy is in, appears in the um, hooking most instantons. So in the hooking most instanton context, the exactly same instanton appears. Then um, um, what is the interpretation of the hooking most instantons? And then the uh, general interpretation is that it's about the thermodynamic uh, fluctuations of uh, meta fields. So uh, so if the, the wavelengths of the uh, fluctuations becomes uh, way longer than the Hubble parameter size, then uh, locally it's very homogeneous. So homogeneous 3D entire universe tunnels from here to there. And then the um, probability is well explained by the hooking machine instantons. So some so, um, the, the hooking machine instanton or uh, the entropy of pure disturb uh, space meaning, the, the meaning is the entropy cost, I mean, thermodynamic cost to um, move uh, the field value to here to uh, there. I mean, if, if there is a matter field, but if that is a 
really pure digital without any matter. Is it possible? The question. Uh, if it, it's there really is a, ideally, if there is a definite cosmological constant, then uh, you cannot say about the transitions from here to there, and then. Um, yeah, that's a good question, but <laughs> I have no good idea. Okay, I will ask you later. Thank yeah, yeah, okay, 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 thank you. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, there are indeed many subtle um, issues. Okay, so uh, yeah, then now uh, let's go to the physical meaning of entropy. And my uh, assertion is that indeed entropy cost equals the topology cost. So in what sense? So uh, this is the heuristic interpretation. Uh, first, they introduced, um, I, indeed, I, I catch it, this interpretation from Hawking's a little bit um, semi-popular, semi-expertized um, articles. So if we ignore two sphere, then the space-time becomes effectively two dimensions. So it, um, I want that this is the heuristic explanation. So in two-dimensional case, in the Euclidean geometry, Euclidean manifold, uh, there is the gauss bonnet theorem. So gauss bonnet theorem means that uh, KDA plus um, KGDS. So uh, KDA is, is defined in the two-dimensional uh, manifold, and K is the Gaussian curvature. And KG is defined at the boundary, and extreme curvature of the, I mean geodesic curvature, because the boundary is geodesic, the geodesic curvature at the boundary. If you sum over all the curvatures, then um, this is proportional to the Euler characteristic. So this is um, known by the very famous uh, gauss bonnet theorem. So uh, gauss bonnet theorem describes the global uh, structure of the uh, two-dimensional manifold. So even though all contributions, K, KG, all of them are local quantities, but um, if you sum over all the things, then you obtain the Euler characteristic, which is the, the topological number, and I, I mean the global things. So this is very similar to the Euclidean action integral, because um, Euclidean action have two parts. One is the bulk part, and the other is the boundary part, the extreme curvatures. So if you ignore the two sphere, then maybe it is very similar as the Gaussian curvature and geodesic curvature. And uh, what I'm saying is, um, I don't know how to mathematically exactly match this, but it is intuitively it's very similar to the Euclidean action integral. Therefore, uh, this may um, indicate the action difference may imply the topological difference. Although uh, in four-dimensional case, it, it is very subtle. It is, uh, but I'm um, um, surely I'm not sure. However, uh, still uh, we may guess that action difference may have some information about the topological differences. So uh, in the four-dimensional case, in asymptotically Euclidean um, geometry, the topology is trivial. So uh, there is a Euclidean time direction, which is periodic. So this is S1. And uh, in, in spherical symmetric, no, no, it doesn't necessarily spherical symmetric, but anyway, in, in, in boundary, um, there is a S2, where the coordinate is set and fine. So S1 cross S2 is the Euclidean um, boundary topology. Then um, the, in the, the bulk the Euclidean geometry uh, should uh, be filled. Uh, for this boundary. And then how can you feel? Uh, you know, uh, there's a very uh, famous and simple relation um, of this. N-dimensional disk, um, boundary of N-dimensional disk is S sphere and minus one dimensional sphere. We have this um, uh, very well known uh, relation. So of course this is not the unique way, but uh, you may guess that um, either um, the possible topology is um, D2 cross S2 or S1 cross um, D3, because the boundary of D3 is S2. So either we consider the, uh, this one or this one, then maybe the typical inter intermediating geometries are D2 cross S2 or S1 cross D3. Uh, and interestingly, uh, for this topology, the corresponding the solution is um, the Euclidean Schwarzschild geometry. So D2 is related to tau r, and S2 is related to set time fine. So as I previously mentioned, if you uh, choose a proper Euclidean time, then you will obtain the D2 geometry, uh, which is described by tau and r coordinate. And uh, one other thing is the uh, zero mass case. 
vector zero mass is zero, then it is Minkowski geometry. And in Minkowski geometry, uh, you know, in Minkowski geometry, uh, this is a uh, radial direction, but here is r equals zero. So indeed, um, there is a big hole, and you can clearly identify uh, through the time. So you know, um, tau is nothing but just a circle, and um, here's s two. So this becomes s three. Uh, no, 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 no. This is tau is uh, tau is s. Uh, no, 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 I, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is completely wrong. Tau is S1. So R is, this R is just a line. So R cross the S2 becomes D3. So uh, this D3 corresponds to here. D3 is R set up by, and S1 is the over the Euclidean time. So um, the Euclidean Schwarz state and um, periodically identified Euclidean Minkowski both are both have uh, different topologies. So that is, so according to Hawking, that is the reason why um, um, uh, Minkowski has a zero entropy, but um, black hole space time has a non-trivial entropy. So in this sense, we may conclude as follows: the entropy cost equals the topology cost of the space time. Uh, so um, this uh, terminology appears in the very famous paper of uh, Stephen Hawking in 2005. Uh, in this paper, uh, Hawking confessed that, um, um, it, I, I'm saying confession, <laughs> he confessed that um, uh, indeed information is lost. And um, I was wrong in several years ago. And, I think now information must be conserved, but uh, the essential idea in 2005 is this. So you can see that uh, the boundary is S1 cross S2. And trivial topology Minkowski is S1 D3, and um, the other is S2 cross D2. So there are two topologies. And um, according to the Maldasen's paper in ADS, CFT, ADS CFT in context, um, um, the, the um, correlation functions, this kind of correlation functions, must decay to zero for this uh, black hole geometric non-trivial topology. But um, correlation uh, still survives in this uh, trivial topology. So uh, in this sense, um, if you sum over all the geometries, then um, pass integral over topologically trivial matrix like periodic identified ads Minkowski or some is unitary. So um, it's something like this. So um, information is lost in topological non-trivial matrix, uh, something like black holes. However, uh, one cannot tell which topology contributed to the observation. So in, in observations, uh, we have to sum over all the contributions. So even though the correlations decays in the black hole topology, uh, in the trivial topology uh, contribution, um, still the um, uh, correlation survives. And, uh, in the in the end, uh, information must be um, preserved. Uh, that is the brief outline uh, of the uh, Hawking's uh, 2005 um, paper. Mm. However, now uh, I don't know. At the time, Hawking's idea itself was not accepted by many people. And several years later, he wrote a paper with uh, Perry uh, Perry Strom in the Hawking paper. In, in the paper, he says a, a very different story. Mm, so <laughs> so uh, uh, again, uh, Hawking said uh, that um, following the uh, Perry Strom in um, uh, paper, he can explain the information of paradox once again. But um, that version of uh, resolution is very different from the 2005 uh, uh, explanation. So I don't know what is the Hawking's original idea and why he changes the explanations. So that is my mystery. So, and I don't have a good idea. But uh, anyway, even though uh, Hawking's 2005 idea is very uh, good idea, but um, it may not be sufficient because uh, information will be preserved by highly uh, exponentially suppressed uh, histories. Mm, so the probability is highly uh, suppressed. However, uh, if uh, any processes are unitary, then uh, there must be a Poincaré recurrence. And in the Poincaré recurrence, 
uh, this the decrease the probability should um, I mean decrease the correlation should increase to order one um, parameter and can it happen really or not and um, recently I myself wrote uh, this paper and I briefly uh, made some ideas so um, um, this is beyond the scope of this lecture so uh, if you are interested in uh, then please see this article this is my um, uh, advertisement of my paper so uh, I, I think I don't have enough time but uh, let me very quickly um, um, mention about the third row of black hole thermodynamics so based on this um, paper, Hawking Robson paper in 1995. Uh, this is this paper. And uh, so um, now in, in this paper, uh, um, Hawking Robson discusses about the extreme black holes, um, entropy of the extreme black holes. So in the you know um, um, uh, in pure Minkowski case, Hawking temperature is zero. So uh, you can periodically identify with any time. Like this, in the extreme charged black holes, Hawking temperature is zero. So the topology is again changes from the non-extreme black hole to the extreme black holes. The topology changes. So the topology is very different. So if you compute um, the entropy from the Euclidean axiom, and then um, in, uh, due to the new topology of the extreme black holes, Euclidean axiom is proportional to the uh, period, I mean Euclidean time. And then, uh, you know, if SE is proportional to beta, then you can simply prove that the entropy is zero. So, so in this paper, 1995 paper, Hooking um they concluded that the, 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 the entropy of the extreme black holes are zero. So the, in the zero temperature limit, entropy approaches to zero. And uh, this is maybe constant to the Max Planck's uh, version of the third law of thermodynamics. So uh, what is the third row of thermodynamics uh, from the uh, thermodynamics textbooks? Then there are several versions. Uh, first version is by the Nernst, and it says then near absolute to zero. All reactions in the system in internal equilibrium takes, take place with no change of entropy. So in entropy, so um, practically speaking, you cannot make the system to the absolute to zero temperature with the finite, um, finite um, operations. That this is the general meaning, and um, Max Planck extended. So the entropy of all systems in internal uh, equilibrium is the same as at absolute to zero, and may be taken to be zero. So in zero temperature, it must be absolute ground state, and there is only one possibility. So if there is only one possibility, then it is very reasonable to say that the, the ground, no, no, I mean zero temperature entropy is zero. This was the the, the Max Planck's idea. Uh, however, there are some uh, examples are known that um, some crystal structure has uh, some residual entropy even uh, near the absolute zero temperature. So the, the thing happens is that uh, maybe uh, so you may decrease the temperature and entropy decreases more and more in asymptotical approaches are constant. And this is the absolute zero temperature. Maybe this, this kind of uh, residual entropy may exist for several uh, cases. So let's say this point is the absolute zero entropy. So um, if this thing happens, then uh, even though on the zero temperature, there may be some non-vanishing entropies. So I think uh, the, the, uh, the, the Hawking law said that the uh, Bekenstein Hawking entropy of zero temperature is zero by observing um, this point. However, uh, what we know very well is that in um, very famous Strom and Jabapas paper, um, they derived the Bekenstein hooking entropy, which is the same as A over 4, in uh, extremal black holes. Here, you can see that it's about the extremal black holes. Then how can it be possible? And I think um, um, this is my, just my interpretation. They um, so string theory is more somehow the fundamental descriptions. So uh, they could uh, count that um, that uh, the residual entropy of the zero temperature uh, system. So uh, 
So even though um, it is inconsistent to the uh, Euclidean path integral approach point of view, um, still I think um, um, uh, so, or um, I can say that the, the difference between the Euclidean path integral approach and string theoretical derivation may say that um, as the string theory de de describes a more somehow the um, fundamental or detailed structure of the uh, microscopic uh, structures. So, um, um, I think that this is very interesting and surprising uh, comparison. Okay, uh, uh, that's my uh, uh, talk today. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the uh, very clear and the nice lecture. And uh, please ask any question. Feel free to ask. I have a question. Can you hear me? Uh, can you a little bit increase your voice? Uh, so I have some questions. Yes. So, uh, can you hear? No. Yes. You can hear. Speak up. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if you consider for the quantum correction and mm. the path integral formulation, mm. then what happens in the free energy side? What, what, what happens in, in what, what side? Free energy side. So okay. free energy. E to the minus beta f is oh, the okay. partition function. Mm. Yes, yes, here. Mm. So if you consider for the quantum correction mm. in the left hand side, mm. then uh, I think the uh, free energy might be modified mm. in such a way that the temperature and the entropy mm. might be modified. So can you expect uh, uh, what happens in the free energy side? Uh, you mean uh, if we do not rely on uh, not only uh, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. approximation, but that's right. Yes, higher corrections. Uh, yeah, that is a very good question, and I think there may be something, but I, I don't know what exactly it is. But uh, yeah, right. So I think uh, so. You know, here is the approximation. So um, if you go beyond this approximation, then there may be some um, other contributions, uh, but I, I'm not sure what it is, but I think so. Yeah, so uh, actually, our uh, uh, left-hand side is actually purely classical, but uh, uh, in the right-hand side, in the free side, we can get what we obtain is the uh, quantum corrected quantities, mm. temperature includes h bar, mm. and the entropy Contain, includes the uh, 1 over h bar, mm. so quantum correct. Mm. So it's very interesting uh, to note that the left hand side is a purely classical, whereas the uh, right hand side is a quantum mechanical. So uh, if you consider for the quantum correction, mm. then the, in the right hand side, mm. so temperature and uh, entropy might be modified as mm. well as the energy. Mm. So uh, is there any paper? <laughs> mm. uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure about that. So, uh, but uh, in the left hand side, indeed, uh, you, uh, you create an action divided by H bar. So, yes. Yeah. So but, the H bar. but the purely classical. All right. That's right. But uh, um, uh, it is not entirely classical because we uh, use the Euclidean time. So, the solution itself is classical, but um, by using the Euclidean time, um, this I think this includes some quantum gravitation or something already. So, any other question? Or...
So I have a question. Here you sum over the some like a geometries. Mm. And probably uh, you sum over the geometry without boundary. Is it correct? Like I uh, uh, Of course, um, uh, there is an asymptotic boundary conditions. Either I mean, asymptotic Minkowski yeah. or asymptotic maybe ADS or whatever. Uh, but uh, like a, you talk about the hot, hot hooking states and uh, you mm. put uh, some geometry, you clear a geometry which does not have like a boundary in the initial condition. Uh, that's right, that's right. Uh, right, right. So in this sense, yeah, if you see this geometry, then uh, there's no initial boundary. Yeah, no initial boundary. Right. So, so when you sum over the geometry, mm -hmm. you also consider only the uh, the geometry which does not have initial boundary. Is it? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. right. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think that this is up to our interest. For example, um, if you want to uh, the, um, compute the entropy itself, then uh, of course we don't need to consider the initial state. However, if you uh, want to see the probability to create some um, some new effect at the horizon, for example, like this, then um, you should start from the initial black holes. I see. Uh, you should see the final conditions, and um, maybe in, uh, this is the pure sugar state, and uh, this is sugar state plus some outcomes. Maybe in some scalar field located here. I don't know. <laughs> then, <laughs> then uh, you you compute the action of uh, final boundary and initial bound and initial boundary, and you define the you action difference. This will be the um, probability to see the tunneling tunneling probability from initial state to the final state. So I think this is up to your um, physical interest. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. I have a one more question. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, can you hear me? Yeah, so I changed my mic. Okay. So, uh, actually, in the Euclidean formalism, so actually, uh, uh, from the uh, hard working wave functional, mm. we define the uh, hard working boundary condition. Mm. So, uh, is it possible to uh, consider unknown state and the path central formalism? In the Euclidean region. No, I'm sorry. So it is possible to what? To consider uh, evaporating black hole in the oh. Euclidean formalism. Uh, I think so. I think so. So in the yesterday's uh, discussion, uh, I mentioned my um, previous paper with uh, Pisin Chen and Misawa Sasaki, uh, and the title was Hawking Radiation as Instantons. So uh, in the in the in this uh, exactly the same uh, geometry, uh, we consider the scalar field uh, perturbations, and then uh, we can interpret such a perturbations can be uh, the uh, Hawking um, radiation. So I, I think that the uh, the Hawking radiation itself can be embedded to the Euclidean path integral formalism. Okay. So. Um, Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, let's go back to the computation between Minkowski and Euclidean Schwarz shape. Yes. And uh, uh, it is a little confusing to me the, the subtraction between these two Gibbons working terms. Mm. So could you explain this, uh, how to relate the previous uh, impl implant Schubert-Shed black hole into machine taught in Minkowski this time? Uh, so, so you mean uh, mathematically uh, or uh, conceptually? I, in my understanding, this subtraction of Gibbons Hawking term mm. is a uh, related to the procedure, conceptual procedure of this impl implanting this toothpaste. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in my understanding, the Euclidean Schwarzschild gibbons Hawking term from integral range from R equal to zero to uh, two, 
from the horizon to some far point and uh, and Minkowski part looks like uh, some large R to infinity. So uh, at the first glance, it looks like a summation between of two contribution, but it turns out to be the subtraction of two given working terms. So, uh, so you are considering the boundary term at the horizon, not only at infinity, but at the horizon. I I mean the the two compute. Entropy, why we subtract these two contribution. So, uh, in, in my understanding, uh, if if uh, you uh, so so you know, in, in first in Minkowski case, uh, there is no boundary at r equals zero because it's completely regular, and yes. and, and in the Blackwell case, there is a maybe there is a would, somehow would be boundary, some putative boundary, but again, if you impose the um, correct period of the Euclidean time, then here is entirely regular. So again, there is no hole and no yes. boundary here. So the only boundary is located but at in, infinity. In this diagram, it looks like a sum of these two shaded regions. Right, 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 right. But the action uh, contribution only at the uh, boundary. Because all bulk term, bulk terms are vanished. Yes. And uh, how how can I understand the relative sign minus? Uh, relative sign minus. I mean the subtraction between the Gibbons of Kington from Euclid Schubert and uh, Minkowski. Mm. So if my memory is right, yes, here, here. here is minus and here is plus. So probably if my, my computation is right, then maybe. Uh, the uh, I, uh, to me, oh. the confusing point is uh, just the first part, mm. SE minus SE Minkowski this time. Uh, this one, this one. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, because um, 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 what we so you know in, in Euclidean path integral, um, uh -huh. so we, we we want to compute the exponential S E, but um, there is a background in Minkowski, so maybe you may compare the Minkowski. Then this is nothing but S E minus S E Minkowski. Uh, it's just uh, kind of a normalization of. Right, 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 right. So you can compare the background and the, the yes. solution. Mm. I see. Yeah. Now it's clear. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Any other question? Uh, if not, let's thank the uh, lecturer again. Okay, thank you very much.